Sweden at uh, Jönköping University and the uh, Jönköping International Business School. Which doesn't make the language any easier. <laughs> so uh, I'm very excited that we get to listen to what Andreas has to say for us today. He is starting the only active, there's one master in architecture in the European system in Lyon, but the person, Jean Michel, who ran that is retiring, and so there's question marks about that being a thing anymore. Uh, and so as of next year, Andreas is starting uh, an information architecture and innovation master program in Yonchefing, which is going to be one of the only academic credentials that you can get that's called information architecture. So, um, the moment. Yeah. Uh, and with uh, Andreas studied at the Polytechnic in Milan and was trained as an architect during a time when architects, at least at the school, as I've heard the tale, uh, they were told that an architect makes everything from a spoon to the city, to the city, everything in between, all levels of uh, things that people need in order to uh, be human. Uh, that is his academic background. And this new school that he's building out in Sweden includes a whole new physical space where uh, Andreas and his students can explore the intertwingularity of the built environment and digital, uh, which includes things like VR, AR, games, et cetera. So I think what he has to say today will be helpful in how you think about your projects. And then after he's had his way with us, uh, you all will be welcome to reconvene in your groups to keep working on your projects. And those of you who are in the VR uh, side of things, if you would like to go into the Cliff House, I'm going to set this up up front here, and uh, uh, it's pretty fucked up up in there. So, uh, <laughs> so I'll be eager to see you uh, what you can do. Yep. So, without further ado, unless there are opening objections, uh, Andreas Rosmini. I can tell you one more thing connected to what Dennis been already saying about going to the IA Summit. There's another opportunity which comes up in September for those of you who are more adventurous, and I'm not sure if it's going to work out, but I suggest in case that you ask them to put you in touch with the organizers. There's the European Information Architecture Summit that will be in Dublin, Ireland, uh, at the end of September. And it works along a similar structure in some way. So those are also volunteers that have out with the rooms and, and things. It's smaller in respect to American one, but if you feel like you could have a pint, maybe <laughs> that could be a good thing to try out. Okay. Um, then, so Dan already said everything about me, including funny language. So you are warned. Uh, sometimes you, you just raise your hand if it sounds completely off and you just get what? Uh, so I can try to rephrase that. Um, when we were discussing what to do today, um, then gave me basically a free hand to torture with everything I felt was appropriate, which I enormously enjoyed. So uh, uh, in general, my idea is to talk about information architecture from the lens of something else. Because one of the things that we clearly don't really have very much established is a way to say, uh, you can look at this thing and judge what then caused the good or bad of it by using terms that are not just, oh, I like it, or, oh, I like that person, so it must be good, right? That happens a lot in all kinds of practices when you don't have a critical system in place. And uh, for the past eight or nine years, but mostly during the past four years, I've been looking at other things as ways to develop a language to help us discuss uh, information architecture. And there's, there's going to be plenty of games or sorts in here. And it all starts with the idea that when we are talking about digital and the stuff that we do, we talk about new media. That's the general name that we give to all things that are sort of like digital, that have to do with websites, apps, video games, all sorts of things. So we call them that way. So whenever I say new media, I mean all of the things that you're using daily that you consider part of what you do. All of these media, is predicated on the idea that it has a spatial structure, it's space. There's no way to get out of there. Uh, anything that you consider with digital has some kind of spatial nature. 
and I will get into that. But I just wanted to put it there. And the corollary of that, the thing that comes immediately after saying, oh, of course it's a space, is the idea that it's a space, you need to navigate through it. You need to move through it in some ways, right? You're familiar with the idea that you navigate a website, right? You go through the menus and scroll through the pages. You're familiar with the idea that you swipe and move through an app and you go into different sections. And all of these things are good, but at the same time, they build on something else that was there before. Right? We can't simply invent out of thin air ways to do things because they are connected to uh, the way we are. And I would just say this little story that comes from Provisive IA and that Dan has heard like a thousand times uh, about the fact that 12, 12 years ago, probably 13 years ago, there were we were in the middle of the start of superhero movies, right? The X-Men movies that had already been out, one of the Spider-Man movies that had already been out, maybe two, but there was not this huge Marvel universe, DC universe and things. And they were starting to uh, shoot or casting at a time, the Superman Returns movie, uh, which probably many of you never heard of, or so like, <laughs> got maybe a firm and on Slashdot, which is like the equivalent of Facebook we had at the time for the geek persons, there was a discussion on who should they cast in the role of Superman. And it was like 2005, so that means that Keanu Reeves was pretty hot at the time, just out of the first uh, Matrix movie. Before Sad Keanu, yeah. for, for reference. And uh, so on Slashdot, somebody said, well, Keanu should be Superman, right? And uh, another person replied, you know, it's a threat. So people just go on and say, well, no, I mean, uh, Keanu is Arthur Way and Superman is what? And of course you stop a little there, right? And then you read on and you just go, okay, this is the answer. Somebody just took that slightly racist connotation and just made it point. He said, well, mm, uh, Keanu is probably like 25% away in. But anyway, the problem is that Superman isn't white, he's a freaking alien. Which is true, right? It comes from Krypton, right? It's not white, green, blue, or any color. And the guy went on and said, We're lucky, he's even bilaterally symmetrical. I guess one arm on the side and one arm on the other side. He could be like a sponge, right? And totally not care about us. Maybe he's 50 foot tall and he looks at us, Oh, another one of those pesky little things that go around my world. And there was like, a silly joke, but it was perfectly useful to explain why navigation and space are useful things. We just don't see them because we are used to moving in physical space. So you're now sitting in a place that has been designed for you to go through a certain type of lecture. Then told you you can go to the other place where you can do group work, something that over here you could do. <coughs> but not so comfortably, right? Yeah, we're and, pretty much stuck in this room though. Yeah, yeah. And, and the general rule is that spatial structures are so much in front of our eyes that it's just like the matrix, we don't see them because we, they, we are in them, right? The idea that Superman can be confused as a white dude from Brooklyn, right? Is exactly that. He's so much like us that we just don't think, oh, he's an alien. Maybe he has different values. And if you, if you were a sponge, maybe he'd have no concept of death, right? And that would be a problem. Go Superman, save them, why? Right, <laughs> that's no point. Well, they're gonna die, what does it mean, right? Uh, so everything that we do is built on this idea of spaces and in spaces, we navigate them. If you just think about the words that we use for Navigation, you go to Google, right? Please go to Google and check that. You don't run out of the door and go all the way to California. You just, you know, go to a web page and even on the page you go down and up and, and turn the page or move to another. And that's because that's reality for us. <coughs> uh, if I want that mug, I need to go there. I can't do mug, come at me. Because it will not happen unless it's a Harry Potter movie. So the thing is that I go there and fetch it. If I need that chair, I need to go there and fetch it until we have Boston Robotics building robotic chairs that will kill us and that will solve the problem. <laughs> but that's the idea. So, and 
The third piece of the picture is that through these spatial structures that we have in place, we tell stories. And of course, some of the stories are really stories. Some of the stories are just a narrative that is in our mind. Like, for example, if I were to ask any of you, what did you do today? You would tell me, well, I woke up and then, I don't know, I took a shower, I had breakfast, I came over here uh, by walking or I stopped by my friend's house and so on and so forth. That would be a terribly boring story for anybody except you, but it would be your story. We tend to see these things as narratives. Other stories are much more interesting, but they're always there, right? And space has been used to do that, give sense to a story for thousands of years. That's why it's so ingrained in us. What you see over there is an old depiction of the Mediterranean Sea and of my home country, Italy, the boot here, uh, and Greece uh, to the right, and parts of Africa to the left. And what you have over there, those lines and things, are a depiction of the uh, travels of uh, Ulysses, Odysseus, right? So part of the Odyssey. Um, the funny thing is that the Odyssey is a very interesting oral story, right? You remember the, the war in Troy has been won. Uh, Ulysses needs to go home, takes 20 years. Well, that was a long break. Uh, and the reason why it takes 20 years is because he keeps, you know, messing his way or you know, just going places he shouldn't go. Uh, and those are the places. If I ask anybody in Europe where we read that thing in school, where well, does the story start? They will say, well, uh, first page, the war is over and he goes on, on a ship and wants to go home. No, that's not the way it starts. It actually starts around here. When he's a prisoner of the nymphs and he's telling his story to them. So he goes back, there's a flashback. Right? We're in the middle of things, he goes back and says, well, I was there and, you know, we won the war and then I moved somewhere else. And then the story picks up, gets current to the place where he is and then moves to other places. And the only reason that you as a reader have this idea that it starts not in the middle of things is because what you have is a geography, it's a journey that has been told to you from the beginning. Just like me asking you, so what did you do today? You don't start from now, normally. It's not like you said, well, now I'm here, but three hours ago, you just thought, well, I woke up. And I understand that you're talking about the past. It's not like I said, what do you mean? Were you sleeping here? It's more like that, right? We are so used to this way of doing things that we just don't consider that. But the moment you're saying that, I picture you in your house or your apartment or a friend's home or whatever, right? The bus station, maybe not. Um, but, and the, Structural framing of this, the information architecture of this, is provided you through geography, an idea of a journey that just moves on. Right this is where I start to tell you. The moment of telling doesn't matter, but the space tells you a lot. And of course, it's not just that the Greek uh, writers or, you know, sort of like, I don't know, troubadours had this, the people singing the stories. But it's been there for like all of the rest of history that we know. Not only, I do have Western examples, but it's very easy to find out even examples from China or other cultures where this happens. It's just more difficult to find nice pictures that you can explain without, you know, being slightly not appropriate in the way you go through the examples for your own uh, goals. This is a painting from a medieval artist depicting St. George not this, that one, uh, say, uh, killing the dragon to save the damsel. That was my idea. Um, and the idea of a quest, which for all of you who play role playing or know about a video game is there all the time, right? Is what is depicted here. The idea of a journey where you go and do something, like in Shrek, right? But Shrek was sort of like making fun of the concept itself. And the only way that you can make fun of the concept is because we all know what it is. There's going to be a tower, there's going to be somebody locked up, and there's going to be a huge dragon, and you need to do something with it, take it out for a pizza or kill it. Okay. <laughs> right? so one or two things. Um, 
This idea of moving through navigable space is common to all types of new media. There's no new media that doesn't have this sort of thing. It's just done differently sometimes. Um, and these have all been, as I showed you, sort of like a part of what makes us human, right? This idea of turning our stories into things that we can closely reconstruct because we have a mental image of their structure. For those of you who are interested in this sort of things, I strongly suggest, if you haven't read it, to fetch a copy of Dracula, the novel, uh, which, by the way, if you haven't read it, sounds and reads absolutely modern, so it doesn't read like a terrible thing from Victorian England, but it's actually really, really modern. And just figure out that. You will see that it's not narrated in chronological order at all. It all goes all over the place. It uses a number of media because if you have uh, stories from newspapers, captain's logs from ships, uh, bits of transcription of dialogue that happened in another room, and you don't know who's the protagonist. Uh, if you do read it, please send me an email and tell me who's the protagonist according to you. I can only tell you that if you consider space, the number of times that they are present as a voice, the protagonist is Dr. Seward. So the uh, person managing the lunatic asylum and not any of the others. Dracula speaks three times in the book. And uh, it's an amazing piece of trying to get you sort of like a bit out of your mind and into somebody else's mind in a way that you don't sound or get out of there confused. In some ways. We've been using these things for doing many different things. This idea of order has been, of course, exploited by architecture in many, many different ways, but also mnemonics, the idea of building a palace in your memory to remember where you put things. It was a very, very uh, common artifice at the time of the Romans. We have treatises on how to build a memory palace in order for you to remember where you can connect concepts when you're de uh, delivering hours of speeches in the Senate. Uh, but of course, also city planning and diagramming and musical notation, for example. We don't think about it that way, but music is like placing dots in a space. And if it stays there, it means something. If it is here, it means something else, and so on. Um, so, we have been sort of dealing with this idea of developing and at the same time managing, controlling the value in all senses, human, economic, in terms of power relations of space. Um, and the funny thing is that as of now, new media adds one thing, we can transmit space, which is First thing that comes to mind is that, have we ever done that? No, this is totally new. And by transmitting space, just think about you playing an or online game. You are transmitting spatial coordinates to the other players and you share a space that is not in your house and not anywhere else. And you could actually say, well, let's put that website on this USB stick, right? And carry it somewhere else. That is something that we couldn't do before. It's not so easy to zip this building into something and carry it some, somewhere else. Um, so this was to tell you about uh, the foundations of the thing that we need to do. Then let's bring in some game theory, or at least a semblance of uh, game theory. Um, whenever we consider games, games are a very specific thing. So in, in day-to-day -day parlance, we say games and play and puzzles and toys, they're all the same, but they are not really. There's a, this very useful formulation by Tracy Fullerton on a book called Game Design Workshop that is actually very, very useful. And she just goes through this in terms of rules and narratives. So a story is a game where you have no agency and you're just listening. It's a story, basically, right? If you move out, you have a toy. And if you've seen kids play, if you remember you play with toys, you remember that normally you have a narrative with that, but you have agency, right? So let's play with the truck or doors or the house or, and, and make up a story. 
but still you have no constraints. The story can lead you anywhere, right? And you would have no problems with that. Then you have puzzles that sort of like give you something that needs to be executed in order to do something, right? You need to solve a little mystery, you need to provide an answer, you need to figure out how certain pieces go together. And at the top of that, you have a game. And I'm not sure if I have the slide where with the definition, so I just try to see what we have there. Well, I can start from here. Uh, games have a formal definition that says that they are closed systems where somebody needs to win in order for us to have a game. In a game, there's somebody who wins and somebody who loses. Without that, you don't have a game, okay? And in order for the game to be interesting to us, it needs to be unbalanced. Meaning that if you're sure that everybody playing the game who gets the red piece wins, you're never gonna play. Right? The game would be how do we decide that you get the red piece? Punching in the face, or you know, that would be the game. But once you have the red piece, you win. So no fun. A game unbalances that by using dice, by using the rules, by using a lot of different uh, mechanisms in order for you to get to uh, someplace. And it's complex. And by that we mean that you have few pieces. It's a closed system. And if we were to put cards there so we can play bridge, you would know exactly that the people sitting there are playing and those standing there looking are not playing. And that there are rules and the game is going to end at a certain point. And you can't win by going out and buying, I don't know, grocery and bringing it in. I won. No, that's not the way the game works, right? You need to have certain combinations of cards and you need to play them at the right moment. So they are extremely useful because through few things, few elements, couple of dice, three cards, uh, hotels, whatever, they can create a complex environment where you play and you're not sure if you're gonna win or if you're gonna lose. And that's where the fun is, right? Why are they useful? And why I do this and torture my students as well with these things? Well, because so much of what you do is complex problems that have no clear boundaries. All right, that's one of the things that we always struggle with. Should I consider that? Should I think about this angle? Should I, you know, if I'm talking about the airport, does transportation to the airport belong to the system? Well, it depends, as we love to say. <coughs> and what about food? And what about water? And what about heating? Oh, we haven't even talked about the planes. What about the schedules? What about regulation? What about this and what about that? And you start feeling like you're not in control. So looking at games allows us to have media that we know very well because the way we tell stories has been with us forever. And we have very clear rules to deal with that, that we can contain. So sort of like having an end farm and being able to look at what is happening. And there's, because of this, great tools to understand the interplay of what we call the ecosystem that we work with, the many different pieces that are there. Um, this is the university I teach, right? I normally sit in this building or roughly around here. And this is the city I live in. And my classes are mostly international students. Uh, for the past three years, out of 30 people in the master's <coughs> classes, I probably had five suites in all. The rest comes from all over the world, China, Afghanistan, Australia, South America, most places around Europe, sometimes the odd American or Canadian. Uh, and that means that we have, at the beginning of the year, or the first year, we have a huge barrier to go through. Because some of these people might be coming from countries who have been at war until yesterday, or maybe are still not in very good relationships uh, in terms of, you know, not even political climate, but more like, we don't like you. We think you're responsible for something bad that has happened to our country. Right? 
And one of the things that we do at the beginning of every year is to play a game of werewolf. Um, if you played it, you know what it is. If you haven't played it, maybe you know about Mafia, which is a very similar game. And these are cards that we use, but you could play with pieces of paper, right? Not even that. You could tell people just what they are. How many of you don't, have never heard about a game? Can you please raise your hand so I can explain what it is very quickly? It's a game that we could even play with all of you, right? It's normally good when you have around 20, 20 something people, but I tend to split my class in two when we do this. And uh, uh, the way we do it, you can see that there's a group playing and there are people uh, standing. And the thing I normally do is just not to embarrass or really sort of torture them from the beginning, like ask them without telling what we're gonna do. Uh, Who's sort of like, who's shameless? Who has no problems in doing anything? And you get the people who raise their hand and you say, okay, you sit in the circle. The others mean like, well, we are sort of like more, uh, we want to see what, what this leads so that you, you can wait and you can play a second uh, round of that. But they are playing Werewolf. And Werewolf is a game where you have, most of these guys sitting are uh, village citizens or like, you know, they are, villagers. Two of them, or three of them, depending on how you want to play, but the numbers changes, but it's still small in respect to the number of villagers, are werewolves. And of course, the villagers don't know the werewolves are. That's why you get a card, right? You turn it around and you look at you, it's, there's a wolf there, it means you're a werewolf. Otherwise, you have a picture of a nice person smiling. Uh, so what happens is that I lead the game. Sometimes I let other people who know the game to lead it because it's not my thing. To, it's more like about them experiencing that. And the game goes in turns. And the first turn starts with everybody sleeping. So they all close their eyes. And I ask the werewolves to wake up. So they look up and they can see each other, right? Oh, the three of us are werewolves. Good. And then I ask them, all right. Tell me who did you kill tonight? And they need to point at one of the others. Of course, they don't kill themselves, right? They want to kill the villagers. Uh, the goal of the game is that werewolves need to eliminate the villagers. The villagers need to eliminate the werewolves before they are too many. The moment that the werewolves and the villagers are unbalanced in favor of the werewolves, the werewolves win, right? So in this case, three werewolves, if they get down to five, they win. Okay, uh, without being caught, of course. And at that point, when they point to a person, everybody wakes up and I go to this unfortunate telling, unfortunately, during the night, you were killed by the werewolves. And so this person needs to step away. And then I ask the others, okay, you need to tell me who you're gonna lynch as the responsible person for this murder. And this is where it gets interesting. And that's why we play the game, right? Uh, we only require these elements, players, information, and a game space. And the game space is that. And the information is enormously biased. These people don't know each other yet and go by assumptions. You're talking too much. You're a werewolf. Oh, you're very silent. You're clearly a werewolf. Oh, you're a German. I don't like Germans. You're a werewolf. Oh, you are from, you know, it doesn't really matter if it's Germany or uh, Chile. It's like, you know, the idea is that for some reason, I don't like you, right? And of course, it's very fun. Lots of nervous laughter. So, uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, uh, I don't like you because you're, you know, I don't know, blonde and I don't like blondes, whatever. Everybody has some idea over this thing. And of course, we should do this of them, you know, doing this. Um, and we play it again, just to make you feel better about yourselves. We play again at the end of the year, and they totally make fun of the fact that now they know each other and can play around those stereotypes as part of the learning process that we go through, dealing with your own biases as a designer or as a person that does strategic thinking. Okay? But you have a game space, and you're using that, and that's the only element that we have to play with. And Tracy Fullerton, in her book, gives us a breakdown how you can start working with games by using this sort of thing. So we say that we have 
formal elements. And in the game of werewolf, the formal elements are, for example, the idea that you have roles, villagers and werewolves, that you have rules. You can't kill three people per night, you kill one. And you need to take a stance for lynching somebody. You can't be silent. You need to raise your hand or keep it down. That means that you're making a decision, which is where most of these people, especially those coming from Asia or China, have issues in respect to, for example, the Germans, who are much more assertive. As a general rule, they go, yeah, yeah, I'll vote for them, kill them, or whatever. While many people just go, I'm not sure, I see what the others do. And you just go, no, you need to take a stance, which is hard, right? Sometimes it goes directly against everything that you've been, you know, taught from the beginning. Uh, but you have rules. And for example, these are the rules from Monopoly or Monopoly you know, or wherever you put the accent. I mean. um, <laughs> and uh, uh, the game has a number of rules. And this is one of the games that we know how to cheat uh, when we are playing. Uh, I'm not sure if I should give it away, but build hotels, doesn't matter where. That's the only way you're gonna win, and you're gonna win surely. Go for that, keep doing that, you will bankrupt everybody. Don't, don't think about, oh, uh, whatever you call it over here, those fancy areas that cost the most, doesn't matter. As soon as you have property, build hotels. You will win, nine times out of 10, okay? And that's why it's a boring game, it lasts forever because it's very difficult to get to that point. Um, but you have a lot of these things, and even in video games, you have resources, even though many of the rules are hidden from you, right? Because the game takes care of, you know, upping your stats, for example, right? Or, or anything. Um, but those are all of the formal elements. Then you have dramatic elements, and we don't think very much about dramatic elements most of the time, in board games, sometimes, but not so much, right? We are taken by the mechanics of the play and interaction without a human. But I use this image all the time because it's very interesting. For those of you who don't know anything about that, it's a screenshot from the Walking Dead uh, video game. You know about the Walking Dead, right? Over here, yes. I imagine that. Um, the game is really, really interesting for one reason, and specifically this scene. So if you're playing one of the two humans uh, and you're trying to keep the zombies out, right? Typical zombie thing. And the one thing that you do, this is played on, on I guess it's a semi PC, but I played it on a, on a PlayStation. I have my controller and I need to press a thousand times the square button. And it's not particularly fun. And I mean, if I were to give it to you and say, press this button a thousand times, you would just go, uh, and stop after a while. In the game, it's incredibly emotional if you love these sort of games, of course. Because that means that if you stop doing that, the zombie come in and eat you, which is not a good thing. Um, so something that is absolutely mechanical suddenly becomes charged with meaning for you, right? In the context of the game. And that is what the dramatic elements do. You could totally imagine the scene played differently, right? You're inside a house and something else is happening outside and you need to keep the door closed because there's the, I don't know, the IRS at your door uh, or something, right? You could totally change the context in many different ways. And of course, the same thing could be used for many tasks that do not involve doors as well. It's just a dramatic element that you have over there. And we do this in, in games also as well. This is like, or any of you wants a game that will bend your mind if you love board games or if you, need a lot, if you don't love them, uh, seek out this game. It's called Mysterium. Uh, and it's a game where basically the end you say, what did I just play exactly? <laughs> and how did we get to the end? Uh, it's, I, I won't give it away unless on one-on-one on -one conversations. But the whole setup is like uh, somebody died years before and there's going to be a seance in the, in the house and the people play mediums who try to communicate with the ghost to solve the murder, very much like Clue, right? The only problem is that that's a ghost. That means it can't talk to you, it gives you images. 
and that is where everything goes, you know, uh, legs up, and people start going, "What? Um, why, why do I have a car with a mouse on a on a coach drinking Guinness?" And you just go, "That's not what it is." Oh, and and from there it's just you know pure fun, but it still rules. And this is where actually <coughs> Tracy Fullerton's stops there. She says that you have formal elements and dramatic elements. And she makes a little bit of a, a point of saying, you also have boundaries in games, and boundaries are part of the formal elements. And uh, I, it's not like I don't agree, it's more like there's more to that. So I introduced in that model the idea that you also have a third basket, a third category of elements, which is spatial elements. And just to go back to uh, the Monopoly game, you clearly have spatial elements over here. You keep your money out in front of you, you go on, you know, you, you can't place your pawn over here, right? Your meeple, whatever you call this, over here, uh, in the middle. It's to be one or the other. So those lines actually have meaning, right? And it's like you go around and around and around and it never changes. <laughs> the, the environment changes as you build up your real estate properties, but it doesn't really change. But there's plenty of, of spatial elements, right? You need that in order to play the game. You can't do without, right? Um, and that is an interesting thing. There is no game without game space even though we don't normally consider that. It can be really, really different. Like in video games, and this is a, an incredible rendering of the full environment of a game that is spectacular and so flowed, you would want to kill the designer. Um, and who's a very famous designer? This is The Last Guardian, and it's from Kumito Ueda, who is uh, this Japanese designer who made also Shadow of the Colossus, and the eco game that you should definitely seek out if you have a remote interest in anything connected to games and the way that you pick space. You never get to see this picture in the game. You never see it. You're always inside the environment and you never get to see all of it together, right? But at the same time, there are very interesting variations. This is another game called Hobbit's Tales. And uh, again, this is great when you have people that are good at telling stories because the game is all about telling a story from a start and a finish with other people's interrupting and telling you, oh, that's not how it happened. I remember you were in Brie and you met a giant troll and you have to make up from there and just go, oh, yeah, 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 I remember that. Oh, that, that's what happened. And just move on. But again, they give you a small board in which the cars have to stand, even though it's a game, that just happens because you're sharing a common space around the table. There's even uh, coasters in the game, it's, it's, these things over here, because you're supposed to be at the Green Dragon Tavern drinking your ale or whatever. So, um, but just to make the point that I'm not sort of like stretching the boundaries, I think that at least once in your life you played charades, right? And then it's like, oh, there's no space in that game, right? It's just people making funny gestures. Well, try playing it from here with me in Sweden. It wouldn't work, I can tell you, because I cannot see you. So we could create something where we share the same space by using Skype or something else, but we need to share the same game space. In order for Shoaz to work, you need to be able to see what I'm doing, two words, three syllables a dog or whatever, right? And uh, without that, there's no game. Even if you're extremely good, there's no chance that I can guess. And uh, the way we define these spacing games changes, changes constantly. It's an example of space in a game. And it's not like if that little kid missteps, she would fall down a cliff or sort of like go face first into a wall. Those are just drawings on the ground, right? But they have a semantic meaning. If you want to play the game, you need to do the right sequence and stay within the spaces. 
because otherwise it doesn't work. This is more tricky, right? Um, if you ever played hide and seek, you, I don't, I, I used to have a friend who had the, let's say, not the habit because he didn't do it very often, but once in a while, he would just disappear and we would look for him for ages thinking that sneaky bastard now is coming up and just, you know, free everybody. And instead he went home and had dinner while we were looking for him. And that was extremely unsatisfying from a game standpoint. Uh, the idea is that you have no boundaries for real around that game, right? There's no, you can sort of agree not far than the, you know, further than that or stay within the park or whatever. But still, it's negotiated, and it changes, right? While you're playing, still. you know perfectly well that you're playing, and the others know that you're playing. And if you break the rules, like going home for dinner, people are gonna get angry, right? Especially if they were looking for you for two hours, as we did once. But um, that's that's the deal. And yeah, you know, even more interesting things. This is a, a, a thing that delights us Europeans. Uh, this is a game that was played at the University of Pennsylvania, I think, if I remember correctly, but it could be somewhere else. Um, and it's a map of this thing they did on this zombie day. So they were playing our sort of like uh, real live enactment of zombie apocalypse. So within this boundary, you can be a zombie and we're playing a game and it's so cool because everybody is dressed like a zombie and it can bite you or whatever. If you go here where we actually put these red lines, they're gonna shoot you if they see you go around like that. And uh, then it's game over, right? So the idea is that by staying within the boundaries of this very physical game that happens there, you are safe and you can play because we know we're playing. If you move outside of those boundaries, then all bets are off because yeah, somebody might get scared, right? And so on. Um, so let's try to bring this thing to video games, right? This idea that we have built on our capacity for understanding space, that that goes with an idea of a story, and that we can break down these complex but bounded experiences using formal, dramatic and spatial elements, right? You probably haven't seen this game. If you have, it's because you're a nerd, let me tell you. Uh, this was out in 89, I think. I played it, confess. Uh, it's called Maniac Mansion. It has had a couple of remakes, I think. And it's one of those, probably the, the secondest, that's a word, uh, uh, it was the second uh, adventure that LucasArts at the time produced. Uh, the first one was Zack McCracken and the Alien Mindbenders. Uh, look it up, it's, a, it's an amazing game with no meaning whatsoever in the end. Uh, things just explode, it's like a Michael Bay movie. Just, <laughs> something happens there. So, um, but the game works by making you go around and do things, just like Monkey Island if you see it, and you have verbs. So you can click push and then go to the door and click on the door you will try to push the door and so on, right? But the interesting thing is how this game is laid out. Just look at the person standing right in front of you and when you say, okay, we need to go to another place, it will just go and walk out on one side or the other. Even when there are doors at the end, so like in front of you, there will be this strange mechanism where you move out. And the structure of the gate is like this. This is the full game. So all of the different environments are connected by links that are sometimes physical, like meaning there's a logic to the way these two rooms attach to each other. Some others, no logic at all. It's just, you know, theater, just like it's meant to be, right? This is created on, on the idea that people understand a scene. So you're presented with your view into the scene every single time. If you look at the pictures, they're pretty small, but there is no weird angle. You're always seeing this room as I'm seeing you now, and as you are seeing me, there's a wall behind me, there's a wall behind you, straight on, the way you would go to a theater play, right? Same thing. And uh, you move through these different things. 
Monkey Island is the best example of that, right? The game where you were allowed to have a rubber chicken and you didn't know what to do with it. But um, that's the metaphor that is behind all of this, right? The idea of uh, theater space and the stage. Um, so they bring in these conventions that you rely upon and you know what is going to happen. If the person moves to the side, you normally are not concerned with the fact that they can fall off some cliff there. There's going to be a room if you can move. And the individual scenes work very much like that. But the topology, the global system is absolutely fictional and it's arbitrary. If you go and look at that game and look at the house from the outside, because you can look at the house from the outside at the beginning of the game, and you try to understand where the different rooms are, you will end up with one of those houses that are probably this size from the outside and this size from the inside, right? Like in a sort of like magic uh, universe where things change dimension and sizes all the time. Uh, this mechanism is still widely used, even though we do different things. This is a screenshot from a game called uh, Prince of Persia, the reboot, uh, which is kind of like an offshoot of the various Prince of Persia games. And what you see over here are the different areas in which you play. And as you move through these different spaces, you can then gain also powers to move more quickly. You still, you move in a third person perspective in there. So you are going through actual space, but the structure is absolutely arbitrary and overlaid on top of that in, in a way that was convenient for the game, okay? What we say, because we're fancy and we want to say things with, you know, sentences that can be tweeted um, later on, is that architecture is in the service of narrative. The first thing that the people who make the games want to do is give you something that you can follow as a story. So they create the architecture on the basis of what is a good story or a good agency for you to work through. A very good example of this is another game called Thief that some of you might have played again. This is again the remake of an old game that came out I think in 93 or 94. This is the latest version. In this game, uh, this game is set in a sort of like cyberpunk, medieval steampunk uh, environment. So it's pretty much uh, usual things with, you know, bows and arrows and stuff, but you also have a lot of mechanical things happening. And those two people that you see over there are two guys, and you're seeing things from this perspective because your character is a thief and stays in the shadow. You're never engaging in physical combat unless you have to, and normally it's like sneaking behind those guys and you know, clubbing them asleep and leaving them there because you're not supposed to be like this giant you know, warrior fighting everything heads on. Um, one of the best levels in video game design belongs to this game. One of, I think the third one in the series. Uh, and that is uh, uh, Bridgewater Cradle, I think it's called, or something like that. Um, it's, uh, uh, sort of like Victorian-ish uh, abandoned insane asylum uh, where you sneak in and then there's a story going on and you need to find your way out after having, you know, sort of like liberated the ghost of somebody or something. Doesn't really matter. Uh, and this is the, and, and I mean, it's considered one of the best levels ever done in terms of the atmosphere, the way it works, the flow through the game space. This is the blueprint. So I'm not sure how sort of like familiar you are with architecture, but if this is a building, what the hell is this? <laughs> what the hell is this? What the hell is this? Buildings don't work like that. This is not a building. This is a map for a game. And it has a lot of things that make no sense. This is the seclusion area. Okay, three rooms on this side, three rooms on this side, and what the hell is this corridor for? Did they have some money to throw on? Let's make another corridor there. 
because we might need it in the future, you know, we could make a game out of it. That's not the way it works. Take a walk around this building, you will see no such place where they just said, well, uh, yeah, we can make a 500 feet corridor just for the sake of it. Make it two stories on it, just because we can. That's not the way it works. So it's a very good environment for anybody who has an interest in architecture. You just look at that and you go, oh man, this is so bad. It doesn't work, All right? Once you're inside, the fiction holds as much as it holds when you were, so, held, sorry, while you were sort of like going through maniac mansion, but it doesn't stand the test of looking from the outside and trying to figure out the rules of this thing. Same thing with another map that is actually better. This is a game from, uh, this is a blueprint from one of the environments in the Resident Evil games. And you can see that they take, they took a lot of pain trying to make this look like a typical large mansion, right? But look at these rooms. This is a library. This is made so you can walk into it, not find your way out of it, maybe there's a monster behind you, and you have to run around. If these were rooms, you would have doors on this side, doors on that side, doors on this side, because otherwise it doesn't make any sense, right? It's an environment that still suffers heavily from the idea that we need to tell a story. And of course, again, it works. Because we are sort of like stuck into this idea that we follow the narrative and the space follows along. And the same can be said for movies. We don't normally think about that, but uh, movie topology, so the big picture of what a movie, the world that it's showing you, is dictated not by the props and the walls that you see, but the way the camera pans and moves and turns around. That's the only language that they use there. Try to think about it for a moment and imagine that you say, oh no, they're actually shooting inside a room. That's a real environment. Try to look at where the camera really is. How low, how high, can they go through the ceiling? As we do many times, that means there's no ceiling or that they're employing some computer tricks to make you feel like, oh, and now we go away, right? And that happens all the time. We do it sometimes with a very specific intention. This is a, uh, still from uh, the cabinet of Dr. Caligari, which is uh, an expressionist movie uh, back from 1920. And everything is bent, you see? Everything is sort of like strangely shaped. And that's because the space that you see there is a representation of the twisted mind of the people who are inside the movie. Right? It was done consciously. But honestly, it's not that different, right? And when you go and see this movie, which I just chose because this picture is a good example of what I'm trying to say, uh, that's a pretty interesting scene, regardless of the fact you enjoy the movie or not, because it's well shot and, and it sort of has a pace. But Dude in a scuba diving suit, cameras, more dudes there, guy in a barrel, this guy is smoking a cigarette over there and say, what's happening? And this guy is worried about, you know, will it get wet? Do I need to cover it better? And all of this is some plastic or polystyrene used for building the scene. And of course, plenty of green screen because then you need all of Mirkwood behind, right? And so on. Just to make a point, every movie is like this. Even the ones that actually are shot in a specific city. Half of the movie will probably be shot somewhere else. And sometimes we know very well that we go to, oh, that's a wonderful movie set in New York. And half of that is some city in Canada because, you know, taxes or something else, right? And so many of the movies that you're, I, I, I had the most intriguing experience, like, a month ago, or maybe less. There's a new movie that came out on Netflix, and I'm not sure if you're, you have it over here because they're different, but it's the um, real life version of Full Metal Alchemist, which is a Japanese series, now they made a movie. The movie is, half, half of it is shot in Italy, 
because they needed the medieval settings, right? Because this strange story. And it doesn't work for me. It's like me going to the office when I was there. Even the props that they have in, this, in the rooms, they might look maybe even exotic to you. But to me, it's like, oh, that's my grandma's clock. It doesn't work for me. It doesn't work. And that's because there's this odd mixing of tropos that are not, you know, exotic to me, right? But it's always like that. There's always fiction in whatever we do. Um, the question in the back. Yes, sorry. I was just going to mention because I've seen, I watched the movie, I've seen that stuff too. And then one thing that kicks me out of it is the fact that, um, particularly if it's uh, filmed in Italy, <laughs> is that it's supposed to take place in Europe, but all the characters, like all the actors are from Asia. Very and true. It's very weird because I see it and it's like, these are all supposed to be European people. Very true. Since I know that, it takes me out of it. Very true. And, and of course, this is all a lot to do with how we stereotype across the industry, in movies especially, right? The idea that we use uh, different ethnicities for doing different things. It's a Japanese story, so it's meant to feel strange and exotic to a Japanese audience. In the moment it goes global, all sorts of things start to fall apart because it doesn't work on so many levels. It's actually funny, I, I enjoyed it, but it was really like going, oh, I wish I could have a coffee in that room, because that's kind of like the feeling you have, and it's not the same as watching something that is meant to take you elsewhere, right? Uh, this is a game, again, that came out in 92, which made most of the gamers of the time angry, um, at least those I knew and those I read uh, in magazines. We didn't have the internet at the time, or it was like, you know, sort of thing that nobody used, and uh, uh, so it was mostly paper. Uh, it's called Alone in the Dark, and uh, it was the first game where you were moving this character around. It could be either a man or a female, which was great for the time, but also the fact that you go to this house, which is very Lovecraftian environment with monsters and things to solve something. Uh, if you see a difference, this is more or less the same time where those LucasArts games were coming out. You can immediately spot a difference from here. This is inside the game. So this is a typical horror movie or thriller movie shot where you are low and down and in a corner and watching up, right? And the game made a point of doing that all the time, right? This is another scene where you enter a ballroom and there are ghosts dancing right? And it's shot from high above. And the camera followed you through the different rooms in this way, and that was make everybody angry. We were used to click there and you go there. This game, you moved around, the camera turned, and you suddenly were going, oh, God, where am I going? And you ended up, you know, being killed or falling down cliffs or all sorts of things. And of course, it made people very angry. You go to the attic of this room and you have this wonderful scene where you are seeing him from far above and you need to navigate the environment and then you move down and this is confusing but I can explain it to you what happened you just enter the room that you see behind and the camera goes out and that thing that you see that seems like a naked chicken or something <laughs> is, is actually a monster that crashes through the window and comes in to fight you and when that happens you're inside and you're just walking and you're looking at your character the game cuts out and gives you this moment where the monster enters, which is movies. That's the way movies do it. At the time, it was scary as hell. First time you play, because you were not accustomed to that. Now we see this all the time. But this was absolutely new and absolutely frustrating. Absolutely frustrating. Absolutely. And um, so how do we do this in board games? Uh, all the time. Uh, this is a variation of Pandemic that you probably know. Uh, it's called Rise of Cthulhu, if I remember correctly. And uh, it's a Cthulhu game where you go around and fight those odd creatures filled up with tentacles to their nostrils. And, uh, um, but it's a depiction of America. Again, you have cities in Rhode Island or somewhere. Well, you have Harkham and you have the usual things like, you know, Innsmouth and, and so on and so forth. And you move around. Uh, the table trying to contain uh, the coming of 
two in one all of these many years. This is even more interesting. Uh, it's another board game that is called Last Night on Earth. It's a zombie game. Uh, you combine pieces into a map at the beginning, so the map changes depending on the game. If you ever seen a B movie with teenagers and zombies, that's it. Uh, it's exactly that. And you can see that we are seeing over here a church. And uh, these are characters, and uh, the other ones are zombies, and you move around your pieces. And you actually have all, all of your characters in the game are like the typical, there's the jock, there's the priest, there's the sheriff, there's the gas station dude who's always drunk, and so on and so forth. And, uh, and it's a fascinating game, because lots of people are not capable of playing these games from the get-go, because there's this odd variation on the idea, it's real, but it's not real because, I mean, they're used to Monopoly and these other games where you have created a different structure. But this mimics the real world in some ways. And there's an odd moment for them that I, they are not capable of maintaining things. Just to make a point, you have the same thing over here. This is again a point where you can see easily the FOMO and Spatial rules, right? So you place your pieces like that. You don't start out with pieces in the middle. The board is made exactly of 64 squares that need to be in alternate colors and so on and so forth. And the knight can move in a way, um, the king and queen move in a different way, and so on. What you don't see, or we tend not to see, is the dramatic elements of two armies battling, right? Which is there. We just, it's been around so long that we forgot. But if I show you this, zombies, oh, I had a, that's great. If I were to tell you, this is a game where you play a guy who needs to go to the grocery store and you need to buy stuff. And it's the same, but it's, those people are angry customers trying to beat you with a stick. That wouldn't be the same thing. Maybe it would be still an enjoyable game, but it would totally change the way you approach it, right? We have these elements in all games. They are just in different balances. Some games are more special, some games are more controlled by rules, some games rely heavily on the story, but they are always there. So we have things like flow and rhythm coming in because of these elements mixing together. And uh, what you have over here is the old version of Prince of Persia. It's the game that came out in 89, I think. And you had to go through this dungeon uh, to free the princess or whoever she was. It's never clear. Uh, and you are this dude over here, this blonde dude in Persia. Please notice. And uh, you have one hour or real time to play the game. And uh, if you don't succeed, uh, everything is lost. In uh, 2003, Ubisoft remade the game into one of the best games of its genre so far, which is Prince of Persia Sense of Time. Completely changed the thing. They kept a lot of stuff around, including the fact that in the original game, to give you an idea of the one hour time, the scene is like the evil vizier comes in and says, marry me. And she says, oh no, we'll never do that. Oh God. And uh, one hour and then I will throw you to the lions or whatever you do when you're evil. Um, and that's the point where you start your adventure, right? In the game that was remade, the sense of time are the center of the story, but they are different. At the beginning, you play the prince, which is not a prince for real, uh, but it's some sort of prince. And uh, since you're rush and impetuous and you filled with pride, you do a thing that you shouldn't do, and you free the sense of, the sense of time which are contained in, into this object that you have as a spoil of war. And when that happens, everybody becomes a sand monster, because of course that's what happens when you drop a bit of sand on the floor. Uh, and from there on, you find out that you're very good at parkour. Uh, <laughs> and uh, you do that all the time. And uh, also the fact that the palace you're in is a freaking hellish nightmare of a uh, labyrinth. And what you do is basically that you need to find a way to get to the tower. I'm, I probably have a picture uh, it's later on. Uh, 
Um, so you, you have to navigate this environment and try to save the world once again. Uh, if you ever want to play games that have some meaning, this game is one of the few that has this mechanism with time, sense of time, where you, if you die, you can use the sense that you've been collecting by killing the sand monster to reverse back time until you are capable of redoing what you needed to do. The story is narrated by you from the beginning, and there's this very interesting bit that when you die for real because you did something stupid, which happens to me like a million times, uh, you hear him say, oh, no, that's not how it happened. And you will reach a, restart the game from the last save point, which is very cool as, as a way to keep you in the fiction. Remember, it's like 15 years ago, right? So uh, that was a cool trick. And you go through the palace, and what you have is a rhythm of moments where you explore and do a lot of that parkour, and moments where you enter a room and say, oh, I've been exploring for five minutes. I bet that when I touch the floor of that room, I'm gonna be swarmed by lots of very bad, bad, sad people. And that happens regularly. So after a little while, you can totally predict that that is going to be happening. You only have moments of respite when you find strange places like this that are magical uh, places, not of this world. And that's where your stats go up. If you find these places and you visit them, you become stronger, you know, have more health and the usual stuff that goes on in video games. Throughout all the game, and our friend Jorge would be pleased to know that that's definitely a weenie that you see throughout all of the game. It's the tower where you will end up in the end to fight the super evil uh, vizier. Uh, you keep seeing it and you seem never to get there until the very, you know, final minutes of the game, but it's always there show to you as the moment where the saints of time are doing that things up there. Yeah, Steven Spielberg would be proud of the effects. Um, this is the palace. Again, you never get to see it this way. It's a giant mismatch of different things. And I'm pretty sure that if I ever manage to get some architecture students to break it apart, it will not fall, right? It will not be a real place. There will be moments where you say, wait a second. Uh, I get a big room and you have a small space, it doesn't fit, or you know, where you have that room that should be a fit, and so on, and so on. So that brings me to my final three examples that I want to show you, and I will go through the first uh, two one uh, very, very quickly. Uh, Shadow of the Colossus is another game by this designer, Ueda, uh, that I mentioned, and uh, it's a game where you fight Colossi, or Colossi, I'm not sure how you pronounce it. Um, you are pretty tiny, and you have a horse. He's an asshole, but, but he's a good, he's a, he's a friend. <laughs> well, uh, uh, in the end, you really feel for the horse. And uh, I won't spoil the game, but I mean, yeah. Uh, he's a good friend in the end. But during the game, he sometimes doesn't listen to what you want to do. And those are bad moments, especially when you're chased by these big things. Like, go there, and just doesn't do that. And it's been actually made into part of the game. The idea that that's a horse, it's not a car. So you just don't drive it that way, okay? Uh, the game has a lot of influences which are extremely interesting and then me and Dan could geek over for centuries over how the environment has been recreated and comes from paintings and engravings that are actually existing in the world of art. This is like, I can go back and forth between the two pictures just to show you this bridge and the structure and the castle and the bridge structure and the castles, right? This is a, a I think, Swiss uh, painter by the name of Gerard Trignac. Might be French, but I think it's Swiss. Uh, and uh, uh, absolutely amazing work that has been used throughout the game. When you fight the Colossi or the Colossus of the moment, you have to fight 16 of them, you get always the sort of shots when you begin the fight, which are, again, Camera down, let me see you, and so you can perceive how freaking tall that thing is. And in the game, you need to actually sort of like climb on top of them and kill them doing different things. And uh, they're all different. I will show you another picture. But the most inter interesting thing about a game is that it deals with loss in general. You need to play the game to actually understand what I'm trying to say but it gives you a lot to think about the way you go through games. 
you spend probably 60 or 70 percent of the game going through a freaking beautiful landscape like this one uh, or this one or this one maybe another one this one for hours with your horse <laughs> and nothing else inside because you're in the land of the dead or something and you have to do that it's like 15 minutes on a horse and that's by design Ueda wanted you to be alone with your thoughts he stated that more than once there's no fast travel to Colossus no not even when you found a different location you can do that you want to go there get your horse your and go there that's the only way it's going to work and it's done on purpose and it's slow and it's beautiful and boring and god do i really want to do that why am i going to kill a colossus in the first place that is also part of the game dynamics that you have over there and when you try to when you have this killing phase it's always sort of like you have this beautiful way of preparing you to the encounter and always making a point that colossus was sleeping or minding their own business and you got there with a sword and so you need to battle they never attack you unless you attack them and you always have this sort of like uh you're really really small and you're really really stupid but please go on <laughs> uh, and um my final example i'll spend a little bit more here how many of you have played this game shadow of mordor any one two couple of you three four good oh that's great i normally get one and this go yeah i did like 4,000 hours on it, still <laughs> fighting force. Um, there are another game out now or out last year uh, called Shadow of uh, War, which is sort of like the follow up, but I will talk about the first game. The first game is the Lord of the Rings game set between roughly The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings, but they took some liberties with the idea. So you are a ranger uh, that defends the Black Gates, right? I don't have to do this explain these details, right? The Black Gate is the place where you, Mordor has been sort of like contained that you have. In the Lord of the Rings, it's already part of Sauron's domain, but at the time there are ranges of Gondor guarding the borders, right? Only it doesn't start like that. You're dead. And you start to have visions at the beginning. So like you have visions of what has been happening and you basically see part of your happy life with your son and your wife. Uh, who doesn't really want to be there, but there's some integrated family business going on. And, uh, and then suddenly orcs come and basically you uh, try to kill a few of them and that's your tutorial, right? But then you succumb to the forces and they kill your wife, your son and you in a ritual that is meant to bring some spirit back into uh, Middle Earth only. The final seed that you think before the game starts is that the spirit doesn't go into the person that it was meant to be one of the baddies from Sauron's army, but into you. And that spirit allows you to be this sort of badass blue thing. Uh, and you find out along, uh, after a little while, that not only that is an elf, but is the freaking Caleprimbor, the guy who made the rings, right? And was tricked by Sauron who made the one ring to rule them all, right? So he's the one responsible for everything else. Uh, but he doesn't know he is Kelevimo, he has lost his memory. Because of that, you gain a lot of badass powers that allow you, first of all, never to die, to the point that you orcs call you the Grave Walker because they think they kill you, but you always come back, which is annoying if you're an orc. Um, I wanted to show you a couple of things. This is a map from, uh, I think this is uh, Paris, London. London. Um, one of the Assassin's Creed games, the one based in London, they did an incredible work as uh, rebuilding London based on the maps that they had. So this is part of the game space. And again, if you want to do virtual tourism in Victorian London, this is a great game. Um, this is the map of Shadow of Mordor, very much less detail, right? Of course, Mordor is not as you know, pretty as, as London. But still, there's a lot less detail over here. At the same time, the two games are very similar in the way they work. This is a shot from Assassin's Creed, 
for those of you who haven't played Assassin's Creed, you play an assassin who assassinates people, and you have knives and all stuff, and you don't want to jump on your victims from above and stab them to death before they can do anything. And that's the typical thing that you see in the movies, right? staying there and just jumping down. Uh, this is what you do in Shadow of Mordor. Poor innocent orcs having some fun, and you are on top of that and just go, I'm gonna jump down on you and kill you, because that's what I do. Uh, because you, you want revenge, right? That's, that's the whole motivation of the game. So they're pretty similar in terms of mechanics, but it feel and work totally different. And one of the reasons is the thing that I want to talk about, which is the nemesis system. Why do I want to talk about the nemesis system? Because the nemesis system, which I will tell you what it is, is the best example of IA in games I have ever encountered. And it's also a way for us to understand how the different elements of a game work out to create a world that is alive and that we want to experience with just information. So when you start your game, you are told that there's a hierarchy of orcs that you will need to take down in order to get the black hand who is the guy who was responsible of your wife's and your son's death and yours, but you are sort of alive, so that's good. Uh, and in order to do that, you need to go and figure out different orcs because they are not here. So you can see there are spots, right? All of these are orcs and over here in the shade, there are five war chiefs. So they command areas and in order to make them show up, you need to do certain things in the game. But this hierarchy has two characteristics. First of all, it's dynamic. Second, it's yours. The game works through an engine that basically creates orcs that are persistent in your game, but are yours. So this guy is a guy, I don't remember if he has a name over here, uh, no. But you can see he has a very ornate helm with you know, uh, feathers, and he has a fear of caragors, and he has a fear of ghouls, but he has a flaming weapon, and sort of like characteristics that you have in the game, right? I can show you another guy. Oh, no, no. let's go to, through this first. I have other pictures after that. How do they do that? With IA. I'll, I'll go through these three screens before stopping. One, two, and three, right, and four, okay? These are the two elements, I'll go back, okay, that allow you to create orcs that have a name that is individual to you. So it could be that you get Dar or Gom or Ishmos, this sounds very orcish. Uh, Sometimes the names are combined, and together with that, you will get something like Ishmog Cannibal, and maybe Glog Giggles. Yeah, and, and that's an interesting part. They have also different physical appearances, and the Giggles orcs only giggle. When you meet them, they will go through a little cutscene where they tell you things, and I will tell you what, but these ones just go <laughs> and laugh. And you just go, get over it, man. I killed you already. So it's, and, but these are all of the different titles that they can achieve. So it could be like the spike, the sneak, the trainer, and so on and so forth. Their physical appearance is modeled on that. So when you have people like this, uh, like this elite captain, he's a rock flame monger. And you can see that he has flames on his helmet, right? And you can see Kaka the Brown, which doesn't seem right, but anyway, it's pretty brownish. So, um, and so on and so forth. You can build 10 million combinations out of it. And that does not include the fact that you could have worked with the same name and a physical appearance even, but totally completely different stats and a different attitude they recorded tons of, ten, of, of lines of dialogue. And when you encounter them, they will remember if you had a previous encounter. Sometimes you kill them, right? And you just go, good riddance, one less orc. 
Then you go for around Mordor for your business, like, you know, trying to figure out where some, you know, I don't know, tavern, you know, something is. And these guys ambushes you and comes over to you and maybe he's completely wrapped in bandages because you cut his head. So of course he gets bandages over his head. Or maybe he doesn't have an arm anymore. He has some metallic thing like an iron hook or something telling you, you thought you killed me, but I'm stronger and they will fight you again. And if you manage to kill them twice or thrice and they don't die, they become relentless in trying to get to you. Every single time they come back, they have different stats and they become stronger, right? So of course you have more of a challenge. And it's the same if you die at their hand and your turn, you can get vendetta and they will basically say, what the hell, I killed you. I can do it again. And they just go at this. So there's a lot of story happening in this thing when you meet the orcs in their camps and, and so on. That hierarchy that you saw moves independently of what you do. Orcs do battles between them, go on a hunt or, you know, do something else. And through that, they advance in that hierarchy to become war chiefs if something's happened. So that means that an enemy that you s spotted, so you know who they are, and is maybe Ishmoth the cannibal, uh, you do not in have interactions with them you go back after a little time and they've become war chief and they maybe have a different title and you thought you could take them out easily because they were weaklings and now they've become extremely powerful and then they have a group of archers with them or something. And you have an incredible living world around you that doesn't really exist. And it's only made through information. The only thing that you have in here is this database. You can see one of the guys with the bandages. Uh, this one came back. They are not normally like that. And uh, uh, because of that, this guy kills animals. So he's, of course, wearing one of the skulls on his head, right? And he will probably be, if you go at him with one of these animals, he will probably kill it easily because that's what he does and so on. So you have this incredible, a persistent world in which you get to live and you get to sort of like take cool screenshots like this. This is in game. So there's like, if you go to YouTube or to Reddit, you will find people that basically don't have a life since 2014 and just do these things. I was a cool shot. I was on Mount Doom. He's like, come on guys, get a life. Uh, but it's pretty cool. And um, it's all done with IA. You have a structure of names and characteristics and bodily parts that you assemble into a living world. How is that possible? How do we do these things? How do we even manage to do it? Because these things are a system. I'm not sure if Dan has showed you already his uh, ontology, taxonomy, uh, choreography thing. I use a slightly different version when I want to work on this with my students and me and Dan haven't really talked about it, but it's like more ontology, which is the level where the former rules sit for complex systems, right? How many dice do you use and can I actually steal your money from inside a game or not? Then you have topology, the rules in which the different paths interact between them and how they are laid out to create the spatial environment of the place. And then you have, of course, the choreography of the thing that is the dramatic elements that are brought into the game. They work as a system. And the one thing that makes those three things work so well in games like Shadow of Mordor is the IA that keeps them together. You could take out a lot of things and the game could be worse graphically or you know, with less detail with less things to do. But the moment you take away the glue that keeps those three gears going together and that connects you into the story that you want to follow, just like, you know, the Odyssey at the beginning, you are lost in a world of uh, meaningless graphics, right? Why is this important? concluding remarks, because we're very long. Uh, this is a screenshot from Shella, the TV series. 
very good three seasons. Uh, it was one of the best series ever. Uh, this is a scene where John and Sherlock are sort of like going through, well, actually, John is going through his blog. And if you ever see information architecture displayed on a screen, you are seeing it there. Down to the point that it's conveying to use semantic values through typographical convention that we're used to. This is the blog, right? And you can totally tell me which is the title, what is the specific name of the website possibly, right? This one, while well, this is the blog post that they're writing, and so on and so forth. And uh, you have more of this thing. I think maybe I might have an example now. Um, there are lots of those, and of course there are other shows that are doing that as well. House of Cards does that. I only use it to point out to you one thing. You are still seeing them with a computer in their hands. There will be a moment where that computer will go away. And we will totally get that that thing is a blog or whatever would be in its, box, in, in its place. Uh, right now, we need the clue. And that is the tension that we are trying to overcome with good information architecture, getting us to get the meaning without the visibility of the thing. This is still needed. We need to make the rules visible to everybody through information architecture. There's another very good scene where Sherlock is using his phone and you see the messages crawling, but you see the phone. At another time, he will be just going through whatever and you will see messages crawling and you know that those things are WhatsApp or Telegram or Mastodon or text messages, whatever. Um, the blending that we're doing is also another interesting part. Has anybody any idea what is happening over here? Do you know what they have in their hands? Yes, it's a move. It's a move controller for the PlayStation. So it's like the Wii mode, right? It's one of those games you keep in your hands and you can play your racquetball or, or anything. So this game is called Joe and Sebastian Joust. And it's basically a game of musical chairs. The funny thing is that you basically have the PlayStation in a corner, you start the game, and then you forget about the PlayStation. Because this game is basically, you have your thing, and while the music is running, everything fine. When the music stops, you need to be able to keep your thing alight. If somebody moves you and you lose your balance, the thing might go off like a candle. If it switches off because of movement, too much movement, you're out. But you don't use a computer for this, right? It's like perfect blending, as much as we can do right now, of a physical game that uses digital to become more interesting. You could play with candles, but you would risk burning the place down, right? And it's not so fun. Uh, so we're using digital to do that. We are going to a place where we're blending this and we see it every day. Think about the way we use Google Maps to orientate ourselves for a city. We just don't think about it. That's why games are good, because they make us think. You all, you all use Google Maps and Uber or Lyft or this and that, but you don't think that you are overlapping a digital layer on top of physical reality. Games are good because they allow us to say, oh, it's a small system, I can control it. Okay, that's all. I managed, yeah, I managed to confuse you, so please go on <laughs> questions if you have any, which would be extremely delightful. Yes? Just wanted to offer up uh, Jonathan Blow's The Witness as a modern example of uh, what you talked about, that the game can't exist without the space. Mm -hmm. so. Can you explain the game? In The Witness is basically an environmental puzzle game that you navigate and you observe the solutions by positioning yourself in space uh, throughout this three-dimensional environment. And when you get a certain perspective, you can see a puzzle solution. And they're hidden throughout the environment. So it's a very mysterious game, uh, but I think reinforces your point quite a lot. It's a very good space. example. I mean, probably, we'll probably look it up. It's uh, really interesting. Yes, thank you. Anybody who says, like, you know, uh, didn't believe any of that. <laughs> No, I, not that I didn't believe it. <laughs> but, uh, when you were talking about that last game, Shadow of Mordor, and 
the importance of that storyline and the orcs and the academy kind of made me think back to that quote about the architecture being in support of the narrative. Yeah. But in that case, it kind of seems that the narrative is actually the architecture. And I'm wondering if that's this presentation or if there if we can abstract some of this away to other digital spaces and platforms like a social media platform, yeah, where the narrative really does seem to be the architecture there. Is that appropriate? It's definitely there. And I mean, have you ever thought about the fact that uh, do you, are you on, for example, on Twitter, just to take an yeah. example, so easy. okay, what do you use? What, what is your access to Twitter? My phone. Through the Twitter app? Yeah. Okay, so you are having an experience of Twitter that is mandated by the rules that they have put in place in order for you to have a timeline, a scroll, right? This infinite loop of things. And are you allowed to have a different one? No. No. Are you allowed to mangle the one or change it in any way once you find out what you have? Only temporarily, that's the answer, right? Because you could search for certain hashtags or certain people and then you would get a different view. But that's the model in Twitter. There are applications that tap into the Twitter data that actually allow you to do different things with it. And theoretically, if they haven't taken it away, you can still use it through text messages, right? And that would give you a totally different perception of what the Twitter space is. You're inside a world, if you allow me this, where Jack and the others who build the application uh, have decided that that way is the way you want to see news or tweets, whatever you want to call them. Uh, that is not necessary, meaning that is not the only way it can be done. There's no reason for that. Why should you not be able to say, what I want to have in my feed is only things that have this keyword in, and only that? Why shouldn't you allow the freedom to choose that? And I'm not saying that it would be a good idea. I'm trying to say there are other ways. Nothing is necessary. It's not like that's the only way we can do it, right? And the same you are saying if you go wider, try to think about the ruckus that came up with Facebook. First of all, changing from you know the idea of a timeline that is actually a chronological thing to now we have our secret algorithm, and now just going oh well actually we are so good you will see more things from your friends because we changed the algorithm. That is an architectonical decision, an architectural decision that has been made. We don't think about it, but there's a huge reason that Facebook moved away from the idea of just being chronological. And that has to do a lot with the fact that Facebook gives you the moment you're coming in, right? If you have a thing where you started being on Facebook, and if you tell them, your birthday, they will also add when you were born, right? Because they map things, so it might happen that you have a picture from when you were five years old mapped into that. That also implies that there will be a date where you will die, and they will be there to chronicle that. And that is not a good thought. It might be a good thought for some of us, personally. It's not a good thought for a business venture to have customers to which you can barely tell them, well, we get you from birth to, uh, uh, yeah, when you leave this valley of tears. It's not a good thing. So they change that model around in a way that you don't have that. You have this giant confusion that you have right now with lots of people clicking constantly, please keep me chronological, right? But at the same time, there's a reason. And that is what it means to create architectural or architectural decisions in there. They are different in terms of what they actually are, but they all boil down to the fact that you make a formal decision, structure elements in this order, that becomes a spatial decision or that is also a spatial decision because laying down elements like this, why not like this, right? You could have done that, right? Some dashboard, I love placing things like that. And why not the reverse? 
Why don't we just go up with the list, right? There are decisions there. They are not natural. They're all designed. It's not like that we can't follow in any other way. A book doesn't work like that, right? But a scroll does. If you go to the Romans, they had to. If you were a rich Roman, you had a person who was holding the score for you because you needed to take notes on the side, right? But that's how a score works. So we are using an architecture. We're just doing that implicitly. The, the goal of showing you the game and telling you, you know, the thing that seems so real is actually the product of formal, dramatic, and spatial rules that you can understand. They're simple. They're there. Some of them, they are so much in front of your eyes that you don't see them. So you just need to wait, I need to see them. Is the only way that you can make sort of like conscious and pondered and sort of like aware, uh, be aware of, of what you're trying to do in terms of, uh, of results. It's not like it's the only way. There are many, you just need to be able to see them. And that's the only reason. See that in a game, you will, you will not be able not to see that anymore in Facebook. I'm not even sure if it's like that. Still, might have changed, I'm trying to picture it. But at least three or four years ago, your timeline made a point of having your picture large. And if you had a thread where people were coming in, they had a smaller picture. Your picture was still like, I don't mean the, the big one at the top. I mean the one in the conversation. Your picture was larger than the people replying to you. Why? Because it's your freaking timeline. You are boss in there. So you're larger. It's as stupid as that. And that is a spatial uh, relationship that you have with others. You're larger. That means in our mind that that's more important. That's why we have larger fonts and smaller fonts, right? So. It's always a structural decision in the end. Well, to your question, what do you think of uh, this real time in this event? Yeah. But the question of chicken and egg is it there's narrative and then there is this game structure and mechanics thing, and which comes first, or can the structural thing create the narrative thing? Would it be permissible or appropriate to say that? There was a formal, spatial, dramatic sensibility in the story, and that it had to be transcoded into a different formal, spatial, dramatic structure. So that maybe it's the wrong question. It isn't. Uh, did the narrative create the structure, or did the structure? The na any narrative is built this way, and then in order to make it a game, we had to transpose or transcode it into a different formal, spatial, dramatic set of relationships, uh, but one is not the generator of the other or vice versa. So these are just realities. So my, my answer is, is sort of like, I can rely a bit on this picture. I always told Dan from the beginning that the thing I loved about the way he was depicting this relationship, regardless of any conversation you can ever have, how the terms identify paths is that they are years. You move one, all the mechanism turns. But I could start by turning this wheel, or turning this one, or even turning this one, and it doesn't change. I will get movements and a different configuration. I am not privy to the development of the game itself. Uh, I'm pretty sure that they started from the formal things because of the way that these, these games are normally developed. Uh, so they developed the nemesis system, as they call it, the way they build the hierarchy to the point that it's been four years that people just say, this would be awesome for a number of other games, right? So people are saying like a Batman game where you have a hierarchy of, you know, goons and at the top you have the Joker and all the others. Some others are saying, well, you can do much more than that, but Anyway, it can be applied elsewhere. Um, but my take is that narrative and architecture are either sort of going together, so the three elements, the formal and dramatic and spatial, either go together, sometimes one is 
slightly before the other, depending on the balance that you need to acquire. But um, they are not separated in any way. There's a ph phenomenal book by uh, an American researcher called Sara, P-S-A-R-R-A, -R -R -A, last name, which is called Architecture as Narrative. And that is one of the things that is difficult to explain in the context of this lecture, and it's not what I meant to do. But you, we are experiencing spaces and as narratives all the time, all the time. You need to walk through a building in order to be able to understand what the building is for. That's why your house or your home is different from any other. Your apartment is not going to be your friend's apartment. You have a different relationship with all of the layers and stacks of things that you uh, address in that space. So they go together. It might be that for a specific project, one leads the other because there are constraints, business uh, requirements, uh, uh, a wonderful idea that gets translated into something else. But in the end, they need to be there. They might be slightly larger or smaller, depending on what is the project. But if one of them is missing, you, are, you don't have a successful experience in the end, and which means that you don't have a full IA working its way through the system. All right, why don't we come back when the big hand is on the four, almost a 15 minute break, and then reconvene in your groups. Uh, VR people, I'll be setting up the rig over here if you want to peek in there, and then Andreas and I will float around and address any questions or objections uh, that way. Yeah. <laughs> 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 